Welcome to the Bronx Journal. I'm Miguel Perez. Since its founding in 1955, the Bronx County Historical Society has made it its mission to preserve and spread the history of the Bronx to its residents and beyond. But there's one person in particular who has been the heart and soul of this organization, one person who has made it his life mission. His name is Lloyd Alton. He's the official Bronx historian. And today on the Bronx Journal, we're all about to get a history lesson. Professor Alton, it's a real pleasure having you here again. Well, it's very nice to be here again, too. It was six years ago that I interviewed you right. on this program. Right. And I was so impressed with your knowledge, really. Oh, my goodness. Of, I, I, I walked away saying, this man is a walking encyclopedia. <laughs> uh, and, you know, tell me about, first of all, about you. What made you a historian to begin with? Did you always want to know about history? Uh, in a sense, yes. Uh, even when I was a toddler, I was always asking my parents what happened before I was born. Oh, my God. Yes. And uh, I was always interested in history. The first uh, book I ever took out of the New York Public Library as a kid was a history book. And um, I was fascinated with all aspects of history of all over the world. Uh, when I went to college, I majored in history. And after I finished my graduate work, uh, I said, now, now I know a lot about the history of this country and other countries. I know a lot of the history of the city of New York and the state of New York, but absolutely nothing about the history of the place where I was born, where I grew up, where I still live, which is the Bronx. And I discovered there was a Bronx County Historical Society. And they had a series of free public lectures. And I figured the price was right. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so I went to these lectures. And after a series of those lectures, being professionally trained as a historian, it suddenly hit me that the history of the Bronx is really the history of the nation in microcosm. Every important movement in the history of this country also happened in the Bronx. So therefore, we could take a look at what the national historians say is the reason why things occurred and how they had occurred on the national level and see if it is also true in the Bronx. And if it isn't true in the Bronx, why not? And uh, that got me very excited. And so I began to investigate more and more and more and more. And because of that, I'm on the show. Okay, but you you were named a few years ago by former Borough County President Ferrer, wasn't that's that correct. first it, named you on that, the officially, right. and then you were reappointed by other uh, that's Borough right. presidents? That's right. Uh, I was originally appointed in 1996 by Fernando Ferrer, and then reappointed by Adolfo Carrion Jr., and then reappointed by uh, uh, Ruben Diaz Jr., and uh, so I'm still here, and the people of the Bronx are still stuck with and me. And in, in that capacity, as the official historian, yeah. what happens? Do they call you up and, uh, from, from government offices and say, excuse me, we need help with this, but you yeah. should know, help uh, us out? It, it, that happens. That does happen. Uh, but I don't, that all, the people who are uh, in the media, uh, reporters, journalists, uh, contact me for, the, uh, for those reasons as well. People in the general public who want to uh, who want to know something, uh, who have questions, also contact me. Through and, the Historical uh, Society. Through the Historical Society. And uh, 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 according to New York state law, um, I can have my office as the borough historian uh, at, the, at, at a government facility. And if there's no room at the inn, I could have it at the local Historical Society. And I prefer to have my office at the Bronx County Historical Society because they have all the material over there. Absolutely. So if there's anything that I don't know off the top of my head, I have the material there that I could look at and say, oh, oh that's the reason why. Mm -hmm. So you're so you're a history buff uh, as a kid, right. a history major in college. Right. You became a history professor. That's right. You then took on, okay, let me see what about my own neighborhood exactly. and about my own people. Exactly. And then you ended up teaching a class here at Lehman College right. on the history of the Bronx. Right. Tell me about that. Well, what, got, was, what was the synopsis of that class? Well, well first of all, I got, a, I got a call from the person who was the, uh, at that time, the uh, chairman of the history department and said, we have uh, a, a course in our catalog uh, on the history of the Bronx. We haven't found anybody who was qualified to teach it. We think you're qualified to teach it. And I said, what gave you that idea? Mm. <laughs> but in any event, he interviewed me and he hired me and I taught uh, every year uh, up until a few years ago when unfortunately uh, because of the current economic conditions uh, uh, Governor Cuomo had to cut the budget including the budget for the city university and as a result of that uh, they, they can't 
uh, fund me and fund that course, and I hope that sometime in the future the funding will reappear because I feel that it's an important course for, especially for the, for the students who are from the Bronx, but also for the students who are not from the Bronx who want to find out about it. There's a lot of misconceptions about the Bronx, and mm -hmm. I'm, hoping, I'm hoping that you tell me that in that course you dealt with that. Oh, you, yes. You spelled, you, you oh, yes. dispelled the misconceptions and the stereotypes. Right. Tell Absolutely. me about some of those. Well, you know, the, uh, the, the, the most people think uh, of the Bronx today uh, as the Bronx as it existed in 1977 when Jimmy Carter walked the plains when it was of burning. Charlotte. Yeah, when it was burning and with birth and, you know, when, when those famous pictures of the President of the United States, Jimmy Carter, walking on block after block after block of rubble. Devastation in the yeah, South Bronx. Right, and that was the Charlotte Street area. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, uh, you know, and in the entire history of the Bronx, there was more than just that. And moreover, the Bronx has recovered from that, uh, that time. Uh, a few years ago, I received a telephone call from London. Uh, they said, we have a group of people that want to come over and take a tour of the Bronx. And I said, well, what do you want to see? And they say, we, we want to see all the devastated areas. <laughs> Unbelievable. And I said, I'm not going to take you there. And they say, why? Is it too dangerous? I said, no, it doesn't exist anymore. And, uh, you know, it's difficult for people to believe that with a tremendous amount of reconstruction that it has occurred uh, ever since the 1980s, uh, that... We have all new buildings, uh, new residences, new businesses, but, the, but new that image like that. is still there. I've had, the I've had there, here yeah. at Lehman College stu mm. exchange students from France, professor, right. French students who have come to me and said, "I was afraid to come to Lehman. Right. I was afraid to live in the Bronx right. because in France we have this term when we say the Bronx. Right. In French they say the Bronx somehow, right. and it means the worst, the yes. pits. Right. That's that's what they mean when they say the right. Bronx in France. Yeah, and yet." Before that, the Bronx had a very fine reputation. Most people don't know this, but uh, there is, uh, uh, in the north coast of Alaska, uh, a Bronx Creek that was named hmm. by the uh, United States uh, 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 Geological Survey uh, after the Bronx. Uh, there is a section in, the, in western Wyoming uh, that uh, is called the Bronx. Um, and it was uh, named by people who lived there in the early part of the century, and they, they, uh, they thought that was a fine name. Uh, in, there's an island in the middle of the St. Lawrence River near Montreal, uh, and they had a development there around 1914 they called Bronx Park, um, again, because of the fine reputation of the Bronx. And in England, uh, there was a guy who had visited uh, New York City, and went back to England and started a, uh, an engineering firm, and it's the Bronx Engineering Company, because he thought it was a fine name. Mm -hmm. So the Bronx had a great reputation before. And that was tarnished somehow That, that was the tarnished 70s. with that, you know, with Jimmy Carter walking the plains of Charlotte Street. And uh, now we're beginning, and just beginning, to recover from that and getting our just reputation back again. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of pe things about the Bronx that a, pe a lot of people just don't know. Right. A lot of great things about the Bronx. Oh, sure. Even other New Yorkers. You don't have to go to the rest of right. the country. Even other New Yorkers who, you know, think uh, of the Bronx have never right. even been here. That's right. That's right. Tell me about some of those things. What are, the, what are the things they should know about, everybody should know about the Bronx? Well, for instance, the Bronx produced two of the f uh, nation's founding fathers, uh, Louis Morris uh, of Morrisania, uh, signed the Declaration of Independence. And uh, his half-brother, Gouverneur Morris, was uh, one of the principal framers of the Constitution of the United States. In fact, he wrote the language of the Constitution of the United States, including the famous phrase, we the people, wow. which was his thing. And both of them are buried in St. Anne's Church in, uh, on, uh, on St. Anne's Avenue on 140th Street. That's marvelous. I don't know how many people know that the uh, American buffalo, the bison, was saved from extinction in the Bronx and the Bronx Zoo. And if you go to the Bronx Zoo today and you see the buffalo there, uh, it's labeled the mother herd because almost all of the buffalo that are out west are descended from the Bronx buffalo. They were almost extinct except for the ones that were here. That's right, almost extinct except for the ones that were here. Now, people go down to Washington, D.C. all the time and for good reason. 
and they admire the statue of Abraham Lincoln in the Lincoln Memorial. Yes, sir, I do too. All right. How many people know that it was actually sculpted in the Bronx by Bronxites? Wow. Uh, they were, uh, Dan now Daniel Chester French uh, designed it, but he did not sculpt it himself. He gave a clay model of the statue to a group of, uh, to, uh, of brothers who were immigrants from Italy who specialized in monumental statuary. And they took uh, 13, uh, excuse me, uh, 26 blocks of Georgia marble, uh, carved the statue, put it on 13 flatbed railway cars, took it down to Washington, D.C., assembled it in the Lincoln Memorial, and it's been there ever since. Mm -hmm. Now, those who have been in Washington know that, the, the, you know that Abraham Lincoln looks down the mall beyond the Washington Monument to the Capitol building. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the most prominent part of the Capitol building is the dome. I don't know how many people know that the dome of the Capitol building is made out of iron and it was manufactured in the Bronx. Mm. Um, there was the Janes and Kirtland Iron Works that used to be on St. Anne's Avenue and 149th Street. And they manufactured, the, 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 during the Civil War, they manufactured the pieces of the, uh, of the Capitol building, uh, of the dome, and they shipped it by rail to Port Morris, where it was transferred to a sloop and then taken the, up the Potomac River in the middle of the Civil War and assembled, uh, and it's been there ever since on the Capitol building. That's our stuff, <laughs> yeah. you know, made in the Bronx. Yeah. Um, I don't know how many people know that uh, in 1955, uh, in Montefiore Hospital, Dr. Seymour Furman uh, actually performed an operation that was the first successful uh, insertion of a portable heart pacemaker in a human being. And people don't know the United Nations began right here. Well, it's certainly the first... Uh, At the first, College. Right, the first, the first uh, uh, substantial decision uh, that was made by the United Nations Security Council occurred on what is now the Lehman campus. Uh, the Security Council met here, and the very first item that come before it uh, was a question of Soviet troops right after World War II wow. that still occupied northern part of Iran, and Iran wanted them out. And the Security Council voted to, uh, to say to the Soviet Union, get them out. And they complied. And when the Soviet Union complied, that gave the United Nations legitimacy that the League of Nations never had. And it's probably one of the major reasons why the United Nations exists today, long after the League of Nations had folded. Professor, stay right there. We'll be right back. We need to take a little short break, but when sure. we come back, we're going to keep talking to Professor Alton, and we're going to find out, first of all, who's buried in the Bronx, who's famous in, from the Bronx. There's a lot that he has to tell us. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm. When I have an asthma attack, I feel scared. Sometimes my parents have to take me to the hospital. I feel like a fish with no water. You know how to react to their asthma attacks. Here's how to prevent them. Call 1-866-NO-ATTACKS. Visit www.noattacks.org or call your doctor. Because even one attack is one too many. Hey, how's it going? Sir, are you okay? What? Oh, this is probably nothing. I'm sure it'll go away. Go away? But, sir, that can't be good. No, it's cool. Really. Do you want a napkin or something? Everything's fine. Thanks. You wouldn't ignore this. So why ignore the signs of a stroke? At the first warning signs, call 911 immediately. Because time lost is brain lost. And we're back with Professor Lloyd Olton, learning all about the history of the Bronx. Professor, uh, before we left uh, for the break, I asked you about the famous people, but let's start with the famous people who are buried in the Bronx. There's okay. a lot of... A lot of famous people who are buried in the Bronx, most of them in Woodlawn Cemetery, but there are some in St. Raymond's. Uh, for instance, in, uh, in, in Woodlawn Cemetery, we have F.W. Woolworth. Uh, the guy who actually... The uh, store chain, The yes. store chain, the five and ten cent store chain. And around the corner from him is his rival, S.H. Kress, uh, which, wow. is now, which is now they're Kmart. Both, they're both in the Bronx? They're both in the Bronx, yes. Um, there is the, uh, the famous uh, 19th century uh, robber baron, Jay Gould. Um, there is uh, Collis P. Huntington, who was one of the uh, builders of the Transcontinental Railroad. 
uh, Admiral David Farragut, first admiral in the United States Navy and a hero in the Civil War. Uh, he's buried there. Is he the one who said, uh, damn the torpedoes full, full speed ahead? That's correct. Okay. He's the one See, who did it. I know it a little bit of history, too. Yeah, <laughs> at the Battle of Mobile Bay, yes. And the, um, uh, you also ha have uh, in the Bronx, believe it or not, Bat Masterson. Uh, wow. Yes. Uh, uh, most people don't know that from late, the old west, right? But late, late in life, he was actually a sports reporter for a New York City newspaper, and believe it or not, he died in the typewriter. So we and we, so we know what his last words were because he was typing them out. Oh my God! Wow, <laughs> Professor. And what about entertainers? Because I know well, there's a lot of, of jazz musicians. Oh, loads uh, of jazz musicians. There's, uh, uh, for instance, there's Miles Davis. There's uh, uh, Duke Ellington. Uh, there's Lionel Hampton, uh, and they're all buried right near each other, mm -hmm. uh, but there is also... Uh, In the Hispanic community, we have Celia Cruz. Yeah, she, Celia Cruz is, uh, you know, has, has her own, and uh, you have, uh, she, she, has, she has her own mausoleum mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in there. Um, so, and if you want to go to, uh, uh, you know, to classical music, you have Fritz Kreisler, and if you want to go to popular music, uh, there is also Irving Berlin and George M. Cohan. Uh, both of them are in Woodlawn Cemetery. Now, if you want to go to... Uh, Does this mean that they were all, at some point, living in the Bronx or no, born in the no, Bronx? No, 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 no. They, 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 they actually decided to, uh, uh, to be buried in Woodlawn. It, it was a conscious decision. Uh, and believe it or not, most people don't know that Robert Moses is buried in Woodlawn Cemetery. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and, and that just scratches the surface. Um, you know, if you want to go into uh, baseball... Uh, you know, Frankie Frisch, the Fordham Flash uh, from the Bronx, uh, who is a member of Baseball's Hall of Fame, is, uh, is buried, uh, buried in the Bronx. Herman Melville, the author of Moby Dick, is buried in Woodlawn Cemetery. Um, wow. There's it goes a, on and on and on and on. Just Woodlawn Cemetery has a, a history uh, just, book. Just history and book. Woodlawn Cemetery is a, is a national historic site. And, uh, as the, and within the cemetery, the grave of David Farragut has just been named a national, uh, a, a national landmark. Hmm. So what about people who are still living, who are still with us, who are from the Bronx? Where are okay. they? Who are they? Okay, well, the first thing that comes to my mind with no particular order, uh, most people don't know that Tony Orlando lived in the Bronx. Uh, he lived in the Bronx for 10 years. He was an executive with a, uh, with a music company uh, at that time and not a performer. Before uh, he became famous and had right, his own TV show right, and all that. Right, okay. right, And uh, uh, most people know that uh, Rita Moreno, uh, you know, lived, yeah. lived in the Bronx. Um, and uh, if you want to, uh, uh, you know, go into, into things like literature, E.L. Doctorow, who wrote uh, Ragtime and Billy Bathgate and World's Fair. Um, if you want to, uh, uh, Mary Higgins Clark, if you're interested in suspense. Um, uh, b both came from the Bronx. Uh, uh, if you want to go into you know into the movies, uh, there is uh, um, a Penny Marshall and her brother Gary Marshall. They're both uh, from here. Bo both from here, uh, and uh, uh, there are J Lo. J Lo and Al Pacino. I didn't know that. Yeah, he's he's from the Bronx, and so is his good friend Danny Aiello. They met at a pool hall in the Bronx. Wow. <laughs> and they're very good friends. Uh, so, I mean, you, uh, and, and it goes on and on and on and on. And these people, of course, are alive today. Um, and they, uh, um, and, you know, again, we're talking about literature. Herman Woke, who wrote The K-Mutiny, mm -hmm. he's, he's still alive uh, and well into his 90s. Uh, but the, uh, so you, you have loads of people uh, who are from the Bronx uh, and got their start in the Bronx. So, Professor, let's say you're somewhere else in the country and, and you say, you know, I'm the Bronx historian, and people say, okay, so when I go to the Bronx, what should I see there? What do you tell them? Well, of course, there's, there, there, there's always the big three that uh, most people draw, the Yankee Stadium, the Bronx Zoo, and the New York Botanical Gardens. Absolutely. But beyond those, uh, th those places, uh, you have the... Uh, the historic houses uh, in, in the Bronx, uh, the Van Cortlandt House, which is the oldest house, 1748, where George Washington slept three times. Uh, there is the Valentine Varian House, which is now the Museum of Bronx History, operated by the Bronx County Historical Society, but that survived six battles during the American Revolution. 
There is the Edgar Allan Poe Cottage, where uh, Edgar Allan Poe lived the last years of his life and uh, where his wife passed away, but this is also where he wrote The Bells and Annabelle Lee. Mm. Uh, that's, uh, that's in the Bronx. There's the Bartow Pell Mansion in uh, Pelham Bay Park, uh, which is a beautiful mansion uh, built by a wealthy merchant family. Um, so that's okay. You can go to Wave Hill, uh, which is a, uh, an estate uh, that was a private estate but is now used as a botanical garden and a place for uh, musical offerings and, uh, and, and art exhibitions as well. Uh, you could go to uh, all of the parks in the Bronx. Uh, most people don't know that 25% uh, of the landmass of the Bronx is parkland. Which is great. Yeah, and it's the largest percentage of any borough in the city of New York. Uh, the largest park in the city is Pelham Bay Park. And if you want to play golf, uh, we've got four golf courses and there's another one on the construction. <laughs> so we'll have five. Um, and uh, we have City Island. We, we have, have beaches. Right. We have City Island, and of course the, uh, you know, which is a little bit of New England in the Bronx. And we have uh, Arthur Avenue, the Little Italy of the Bronx. That's uh, you know uh, ethnic uh, neighborhoods. All kinds of ethnic neighborhoods, and uh, and and Lord knows we have, uh, you know, people from every. We have residents uh, from every continent on the face of the earth. And if you include the penguins in the Bronx Zoo, that includes Antarctica. Okay. <laughs> that we covered. We that covered. we covered it. Right. <laughs> Professor, tell me more about your opinion of how the Bronx has changed. Because, I mean, you've been around for right. a while, and you, you're a historian, and you document yeah. this stuff as it happens. Yeah. So, you know, what do you see that's different now? Well, the only thing that's different is uh, basically you have different ethnic groups that live in areas where other ethnic groups used to live, which is a normal pattern. It happens and, and, time, and yes. It's happened from colonial times onward. Uh, but the interesting thing is that I believe that with all of the change, there is also stability. The people who came in the early part of the 20th century, in those days mostly Italians and Eastern European Jews, were poor as church mice, but middle class in thought. Their entire thought process was get ahead, take care of the kids, get ahead, improve yourself, be better. Well, the same thing is true of the ethnic groups that have come since. The blacks from the south, the Puerto Ricans, and now the Dominicans and the Mexicans. Same thing. Why are they here? They are here because this to them is an opportunity. The American this, dream, the Bronx right. dream. That's right. This is a step up. And their entire outlook is middle class. I'm not middle class yet. I'm not wealthy yet. I don't have the money yet, but I will. That's the mindset. So I find that uh, in the midst of all this change, there is also stability. And that mindset helps us get better. Absolutely. Always gets better. Progress. Get, uh, yes, always gets better. Now, of course, as a historian, I can't talk about progress because that's the future. I'm a historian. I look in the other direction. <laughs> <laughs> but tell me, you, you actually on, I think it was Saturday mornings, you actually conducted, do you still do that, conducted tours of areas of well, the Bronx? Well, there, there, there are tours that I conduct uh, uh, with the Bronx County Historical Society. Uh, I have also trained one of my former students at Lehman, uh, who was very enthusiastic about the history of the Bronx. Uh, and uh, so you have your disciples now. In a sense, and okay. I, I believe that sometime in the future, I can't, I can't predict when, that he will be the Bronx Borough historian. His name, he's now the uh, he got a job, the job with the Historical Society as the education coordinator. What is his name? Angel Hernandez. Okay. And uh, uh, he was a guy who uh, grew up in the Bronx. His, his his mother moved to San Diego, so he had to follow her. But he missed the Bronx terribly. And he went to the public library in San Diego, took out every book about the Bronx and read it, came here, uh, and then we saw that I was giving the course. He took the course, and I could tell that this guy was, uh, you know, interested beyond what I was telling because he had read uh, beyond that. And he's, he's very enthusiastic about the history of the Bronx. So I feel he, he's, he eventually will be an ultimate successor. And he conducts some of those tours he now? He conducts some of those tours now. Okay, and what do those tours cover? What areas, what, what well, places you know, the, you know, it, 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 I have done tours of Mott Haven. I've done tours of the, uh, the lower concourse. I've done tours of the upper concourse. 
I have uh, done tours of uh, the Westchester Square area. I've done tours of uh, the West Farms area. Um, so I've. So you uh, take a group of people and you tell them the history of that section right, of the Bronx. Right. I tell them the history. We we go from place to place, and I say this is it. this building has a particular significance, or on this site, th you know, a very important thing happened. Uh, if I bring them to Lehman, I not only tell them about the, uh, uh, you know, the United Nations here, but most people don't know that in 1866, the area where Lehman is was once a racetrack called, wow. called Jerome Park. And Leonard what, kind of, what kind of racing? Horse racing? Horse racing, yes. And uh, uh, Leonard W. Jerome was the guy who built that track. Uh, and he wanted to restore horse racing, the flat racing, which is, you know, with the jockey on the back, rather than in a sulky uh, that you would have with trotting. He wanted to restore that to the sport of kings. And one of his strategies is to na was to name um, uh, races after his, some of his wealthy friends, hmm. one of whom was August Belmont. I see. And so in 18- And that's how Belmont Park was born. No, that's, no? How, that's how the Belmont Stakes started right at where Lehman stands today. Interesting. And interesting. Belmont Stakes was run in the Bronx at Jerome Park until 1890, and then it moved to a new, new park in the East Bronx called Morris Park. And it was run there until 1903, then it moved to Belmont Park. Professor, but it I started can go in the Bronx. on and on with right. this interview, but unfortunately we're out of time. Right. But uh, you have to come back. We have to keep doing this I because I, every time you come here, I learn a lot about the Bronx. <laughs> thank you. Please, thank you, and thank you for being here. Where do, where do people get a hold of you? Through the Historical Society? Through the Historical Society. They could call the Historical Society at 718-881-8900. And if uh, I am not there, there are ways in which I could be contacted, but I'd be glad to help anybody who has any question about the Bronx. Professor, thank you for being on the show. We really appreciate it. We learned a lot from you. We hope you keep coming back because this history lesson, we have to keep repeating so the people in the Bronx know their history. Thank you, sir. And we'll be back next week with another edition of the Bronx Journal.